Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. It's really, it's really great to see everyone here. It's a great, great turnout for a very important topic. Uh, my name is Rachel Schreiber. I am Executive Dean of Parsons School of Design. And I am um, really thrilled to have our distinguished guests and panelists here to discuss this incredibly important topic about how to increase access and equity to higher education. Um, before I dive in, though, I would like to say some words of thanks. Um, first, to everyone um, on my team in my office that really helped pull this event together. Um, Chris Rivera, Molly Rotman, David West, Jen Ree, and in particular, Anthony Curry, who brings um, his event magic to every, every event I've been part of, and I look forward, look forward to many more. Um, yeah. Also want to make sure that everyone knows that this event is part of the New School's Centennial, the Festival of New, which is um, such a rich week of programming, and I encourage you to check out other events and attend, um, attend many of them as we all think about what it means to be a new, the new school that is 100 years old and think about the next 100 years. So it's really a very full week of very, um, very stimulating events. And I also want to make one more shout out to Ashley Bruni, who I think has done a magnificent job of, of hurting a lot of cats and dogs and other types of, of beings <laughs> to, to pull this all off. So thank you, Ashley. Okay, so um, what's going to happen is I'm going to say a few very brief words about our four panelists and then make some remarks and then they will each introduce themselves a little further before we j dive into the, um, to a further discussion. So um, I have on my left Alan Collins, who is the founder of Student Loan Justice and the author of a book titled The Student Loan Scam, The Most Oppressive oppressive debt in US history and how we can fight back. And I really feel that this book should be required reading for anyone who has engaged in higher education in any way. I, I read it years ago, I quote it often, and, um, and I just looked up Alan and said, I need you here for this panel. So um, Alan is currently based in Iowa, Iowa, where he is on the campaign trail and working to make sure that the Democratic candidates for US president have um, student loan reform and higher education on their agendas. So that's something we can ask you more about later. It's very interesting. Yeah. Next, we have Suheni Perez-Sadler, who is senior director of post-secondary in the post-secondary policy office of safety and youth development at the New York City Department of Education. Um, Suheni has also worked in admissions at Barnard College and as a program officer at New Visions for Public Schools. Suheni holds a master's in public affairs and urban regional planning from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and is currently pursuing doctoral work in educational leadership at St. John's. <clears throat> Nick Figueroa is executive director of College Visions. I have to switch to a different page. Um, Nick started his college career at the Community College of Rhode Island and went on to graduate from Roger Williams University with a bachelor's degree in public administration, and he later earned a master's degree in education from the University of Rhode Island. Nick served as a college admissions officer for several years and currently teaches as an adjunct professor. And Nick is here today in his capacity as executive director of an organization called College Visions. Um, the mission of College Visions is, quote, to empower low-income and first-generation college-bound students to realize the promise of higher education by providing advising and resources to promote college enrollment, persistence, and graduation. College Visions advances equal access to educational opportunities in historically underserved communities. Welcome. 
last but not least, certainly um, someone who is already known to many people in this room, Nadia Williams, who is assistant professor here at Parsons and director of the Parsons Scholars Program. Nadia completed her BFA in fashion design here at Parsons and sits on the advisory council of the National Conference of Race and Ethnicity in Higher Education, is co-founder of the Radical Mama Educator Group through NICOR, which is the New York Collective of Radical Educators. And those are just two affiliations from a list of many I could have chosen to, um, to talk about Nadia's affiliations with um, social justice and community justice around, um, and racial justice around higher education. So I now turn things over, oh. Um, yeah, okay, now I, I will say my remarks now. Um, we, there is a deep and widely shared concern in higher education for inequity and lack of access to this amazing education that we offer here at the New School and at Parsons. How will we begin to solve this problem? We know that cost is a significant factor, but it's not the only one. And it's not the only one, but it also intersects, of course, with all the other factors. We also know that admitting a more diverse group of students is not enough. Are we as an institution prepared to ensure the success of every student we bring to campus? What, would that, what does that mean to be prepared in that way? Recent books such as Paul Tuff's The Years That Matter Most, How College Makes or Breaks Us, and Daniel Markovitz's The Meritocracy Trap ask the questions of who benefits from a college education. And a recent article in the New York Times by Anthony Abraham Jack explores through his own experience the ways that institutions are not fully prepared to support the success of students who come from poverty and, all and also the ways that race, socioeconomic status, and cultural context intersect in alienating students from our educational environment. Consider just a few statistics, again, pulled these are examples that, that are pulled from many studies and many, much research that's happening right now on this topic. Enrollment at the 468 best funded and most selective four-year institutions is 75% white, while enrollment in the 3, 000, over 3,000 lowest funded community colleges and four-year institutions is 43% black and Latinx. There is a persistent opportunity gap the overall persistence rate for white students at all higher education institutions is 78.1%. For blacks, the persistence rate is 66.2%. Meanwhile, degree attainment, how, um, the completion of the degree in 41 states shows that the attainment rate among white adults exceeds that of black adults by 16.3 percentage points and that of Latinx adults by 24.5 percentage points. While we continue to strive towards equity and access in higher education, the reality is we have a great deal of work ahead of us. I'm sure that everyone in this room agrees that this is a wicked problem, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't attempt to address it. As we think about how far we may have come as an institution ourselves in our 100-year history, I wanted to focus today's discussion on the future. So after each uh, panelist speaks for a little bit about um, themselves and what they do, we will turn to some forward-looking questions. And with that, I'll turn it to Alan. There we are. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Alan Collinge. Um, uh, my history, my uh, road that led me here is sort of a winding one. Um, I began as an engineer, uh, University of Southern California, California Institute of Technology. Because of my own student loan situation, I began to do some research and it wound me up uh, being featured top story on 60 Minutes, um, which was crazy. Uh, and it's been uh, ever since I've been fighting this battle. Which sounds kind of crazy, right? Student loans, like, come on. I mean, how important can student loans possibly be? But when you really look at the student loan problem, you find that this is a national threat, <laughs> the likes of which, frankly, our country hasn't seen since King George ruled the country. So let me just take you through my slides really quickly. Uh, uh, 
Um, so I guess the, the big numbers uh, that everybody hopefully is aware of but may not be <clears throat> is, uh, first of all, um, we owe about $1.8 trillion today uh, in student loan debt, which is astounding. I mean, when President Reagan was president, the entire national debt was about a trillion dollars, and we owe almost twice that in student loan debt alone today. This is mind-boggling. Uh, at the beginning of the century, year 2000, we owed about $150 billion. Now we are, uh, you know, 1,000% higher than that still. So, and I have to hearken back to the founding of this country. You know, I don't throw the word slavery around lightly. I know, um, you know, the roots go deep in this country. But what we are looking at is some sort of a modern-day form of indentured servitude at the, at the least. Um, it's sort of a debtor's prison without walls, and, and you know this is becoming a civil rights issue. And Thomas Jefferson said it very well. You know, there's two ways to conquer a country: one is by the sword, uh, the other is by debt. Um, so here's the maybe the more important thing that you, one of the most important things I'll say today. We can see in the year 2000, the little red sliver was student loan debt compared to all other revolving debt in the country, such so credit cards. Uh, lines of credit, um, other personal loans. And I mean, talk about a reverse Pac-Man. I mean, how did we get here? I mean, that is just insane. I mean, we had a Democratic president. Sorry, I'm not a partisan guy necessarily, but one would have thought that over eight years of President Obama, the problem would have gotten better, but indeed it has gotten worse. It's a very tough nut to crack. Um, uh, other quick facts that you need to know, and, and I should say, I'm a... Um, I'm kind of a rebel. I, t I have to talk bad about the government because I have been doing research on this for many years. I have to point the finger of blame where the finger of blame needs to point. Uh, and so, uh, first of all, the default rate is just astoundingly high across the board. Right now, everybody that has student loans, they will default at the rate of 40%, probably far higher because this is the 2004 rate. Uh, in 2004, students were only borrowing about one third of what they are borrowing today on average. So if the default rate was 40% for that class, you know, what are we looking at? We're looking at, we're looking at 50% or more, for sure. I mean, that's sort of a, a failed lending system, if you ask me. Um, so, but it gets a little more sinister still, because it turns out <clears throat> that one would think that defaults would be a huge burden on the taxpayers, but in fact, it turns out the government found a way to make a profit on defaulted loans. So this problem could self-perpetuate forever. Uh, and the problem could get far, far worse. Um, and by the way, people of color default at a astoundingly higher rate uh, than uh, white and other uh, students. And if you look at the marketing that is going on these days for the for-profit colleges, which have an 80% default rate, they primarily market to people of color. And that's something to be very, uh, very aware of. Um, so just some fun cartoons. Uh, so, you know, I'm kind of the heavy, and I apologize in advance, but. I have to say, um, the federal government bears a huge amount of responsibility on this, and, th and this really begins with Congress uh, removing some of the most fundamental consumer protections that exist. You know, every loan in this country has bankruptcy protections. It's something that the founders called for, ahead of the power to declare war, ahead of the power to raise an army, uh, ahead of the power to coin currency and create a judiciary in the Constitution. And yet this is a, a protection that has been uniquely stripped from all student loans, public and private. Uh, similarly, student loans have no statutes of limitations, which means that you can be hounded for the rest of your life for this debt. And believe me, it's not just the principle that they come after you for. They will triple, quadruple, quintuple uh, your debt, and there just is no recourse for the borrower. There is no negotiating power. This is why the founders called for bankruptcy rights so strongly. And this is why bankruptcy absolutely, at a minimum, must be returned to student loans. Um, so if I have a solution to give you today, it starts with the return of the constitutional bankruptcy rights. And nobody wants to file for bankruptcy. It's a terrible thing to have to do. But we've got to have that power back on our side. So if you forget everything I say today, just remember, as terrible as bankruptcy is, we've got to fight for it as, as a citizenry, um, because nobody's going to fight for us. Uh, so. Uh, I'll just wrap it up by saying this is some of the stuff that I've been doing. I crash Fox News with signs, which is pretty fun. Uh, we crash the Department of Education with uh, artist performance art, you know, um, a huge inflatable uh, debt ball. We, uh, we talked to Donald Trump, who, by the way, filed for bankruptcy with his businesses many times. 
he has played the bankruptcy code like a fiddle. And, and um, so, and, and good for him, you know, the laws are there for, there's a good reason for bankruptcy protections and Donald Trump certainly, certainly made, that, uh, made that work for him. Um, right now, the last thing I'll say is that there are two bills in the Senate and House right now. Uh, thanks to us, actually, um, I, I give our group, Student Loan Justice, most of the credit for this, um, but these are two bills that simply rem removes the one line of federal code that makes bankruptcy different for student loans than for every other loan in the country. And I thought I would have gotten this done in 2007 or 8, like right after the 60 Minutes piece, but uh, the intransig intransigence and inertia of government is daunting, and it really requires people like yourselves who may be affected, uh, may be working with people who are affected, to stand up and fight for these two bills, S1414, uh, HR 2648. And uh, so I live in Iowa in the cornfields now, and I'm following the presidential candidates around, and hopefully I'll have some great news for you all come the February caucuses. So thank you. everyone. Hello? Okay. Um, it's hard to follow you with the cornfields. <laughs> uh, my name is Eleni, again, Eleni Perez Sadler. Uh, my apologies for my voice. I, my, my kids gave me a lovely gift of strep infection. I am no longer contagious or else I wouldn't be here, so don't worry. <laughs> I am on antibiotics, Nick, don't worry. Uh, but what that means is that I am not able to talk like my usual self and I don't have the usual energy that I have. And so I'm going to be referring to my notes because my brain is really fuzzy from all the antibiotics. <laughs> so um, you know, thank you, everyone, for inviting me here. This is such an important conversation that thankfully is happening at the national level, which is that of equity. For so long, we've been talking about equality and giving everyone the same thing, not realizing that not everybody needs the same thing, right? And so for me, equity shows up in my work every day. I've been doing the work of college access for over 20 years across different sectors, community-based organization, government, uh, higher education, and so, when we talk about equity and we talk about access, it's about increasing the number of low-income students, racial minorities that are underrepresented, and they are underrepresented for a reason, right? Uh, this government was set up, and if we think about who initially went to higher ed, it was the privileged few. And so as we now have uh, an issue with our economy where more and more the college credential is the floor, to um, you know, achieving um, economic success, we need to think about how do we support students um, through these institutions that were not meant to support them, right? So at the Department of Ed, we talk a lot about equity and excellence, and we've had an equity and excellence agenda that was launched by our mayor back in 2015. Started with our younger ones, 3K and pre-K, elementary, focusing on uh, literacy and making sure that all of our students had, um, you know, really strong early literacy skills. Eighth grade algebra, so middle school, we know the importance of math as a gateway, right? And, and how our students who fail to have strong math scores really fail to matriculate into college um, classes and credit earning classes, right? Uh, we then have uh, AP, so looking at making sure that our students have uh, access to college level rigor at the high school level. Uh, so we have an AP for all, college access for all middle school, college access for all high school, uh, which is really focusing on making sure that our students have all of the pre-college um, advisement that is needed. So we're thinking a lot about how to make sure that our students graduate college ready. Uh, last year, 70% of our students, or 76% of our students graduated, which is the highest um, ever in the city. But there's really deep disparities and opportunities. While 76% is the city-wide level, only 37% of our English language learners graduated. I need to pause there. Only 37% of our English language learners graduated. 
And so as a former English language learner myself, I'm first generation college, first generation American, Espanol is my first language. Uh, I obviously think a lot about what, how do we educate our immigrant students to make sure that they have the same opportunities that their higher income um, peers have. And so we're thinking a lot about equity, we're thinking a lot about making sure that our students graduate, but the flip side, right, um, and I was just talking tonight about this, we talk a lot about um, college-ready students, but are our colleges student-ready, right? And so if you know that this student for 13 years when they started, and actually now even more, because we take them younger, we take them when they're three, had free tuition, free books, free transportation, right? Because they, that's what they received as being a Title I. New York City, 70% of our kids are Title I. That's an average uh, income of 30,000 for a family of four. So now you have that student graduate in June, right? And they enroll into your colleges in September. Their income has remained the same, but you're not giving them free books. You're not giving them free meals and you're not giving them free Metro cards anymore. So the, the, I'm gonna get to some of the promising kind of uh, things that I'm seeing because there are some encouraging things happening, but that's really where we as a K through 12 system struggle, where we're like, okay, even our kids that are college ready, are, are, are we able to send them to places that are student ready Places that know this is the student profile, they have these economic disparities, how do we address it, right? How do we um, admit the student and in good conscience not have all of the supports this student uh, needs to make sure that they complete, right? So uh, there are some promising things I will talk about around not making, not only just talking about access now, I'm encouraged by the completion agenda and more and more, more, and more of us talking about success. But I wanna make sure that we continue to push on that success conversation to ensure that uh, the list of schools that are ready to receive my students grow. I'll end it there. There we go. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, Nick Figueroa. Uh, I'm actually a, a, I call myself a New Yorker. I was born and raised here uh, uh, until my teenage years and moved to Providence uh, High School um, and was in for a culture shock moving from, uh, from the city into a place that was really slow paced and uh, not as energetic as the city is, right? Um, for me, as a first-generation uh, low-income student uh, from a, a lat single Latina mom, um, you know, her desire for me was to uh, make sure that I st stayed out of trouble, one, and two, that I uh, ended up working somewhere uh, after high school or, or during high school. Um, and for me, personally, um, communicating with my friends and, and some of them talking about going to college, I was like, what's college? Maybe I can go to college. You know, it sounds like a, a, a good thing to be able to continue my education. So uh, I walked into my guidance counselor's office in the 11th grade and I said, hey, you know, I'm interested in uh, potentially going to college. There's this test called the SAT. I think I'd like to, uh, to take that test. Uh, and the reply that came back to me was, well, college is not for you you should really consider joining the military. Um, and so I left that office thinking maybe, you know, maybe this person is right. They are the guidance counselor. Uh, maybe college isn't for me. Maybe I should go in the military. I didn't end up going in the military. Uh, what I did was, um, by myself, I ended up enrolling at the community college of Rhode Island, which was announced uh, uh, earlier, open enrollment community college, so I was able to do that. Um, but just getting to that place was a lot of work. You know, trying to figure out how to fill out a FAFSA was a lot of work. And, and, and I needed so much help uh, in my mother as well to, uh, to be able to do that. So once I set foot on the college campus 
And this was some time ago, so this is before you could register online for your classes. You had to go to a bulletin board, write down your class, go down and stay in another line, register for that class, or they will tell you that class is full, you have to go back to the board, pick another class, and come back to that, to that line again. So uh, millennials, you don't understand that pain. <laughs> Uh, but just thinking, thinking about that experience and uh, as a student being able to navigate that uh, by really being a self-advocate and uh, forming interdependent relationships with other students to uh, become success successful and graduate from, uh, from a community college institution. So, um, you know, I've, I've certainly been able to uh, progress in my educational career uh, as a, a professional worked as a college admissions officer. So I was on the other side of the table, now uh, recruiting students across the country and talking to them about you know, their GPAs and when they should take the SATs and uh, FAFSA, et cetera. So I came full circle in that way. Um, fast forward to today, I now work for an organization called College Visions, which uh, thinking about the work that we do, uh, I wish had existed when I was a student. Right, because we work specifically with first generation, low income students, we work with undocumented students as well. We have what's called a college access program. We take high school students from the urban core, so it's uh, Providence and surrounding cities, and we work with them a year ahead of time before they go off to school, right? So the summer we have a workshop, uh, we, we talk to them about higher ed, about the higher ed lexicon and uh, financial uh, management for scholarships, and so forth. And then throughout the year, we work with them in terms of uh, helping them select a major, uh, doing college visits, selecting schools, et cetera. Now, one of the things that we like to do, uh, obviously we can't tell students where they should go because that's ultimately their choice. But we do have a, a, a list of schools that provide uh, ample financial aid to students. So we always say look at these schools or look at these programs if they're uh, in-state uh, schools as well. We work with parents. Uh, part of the issue uh, that happens is summer melt, right? When you graduate from high school and now you're ready to go off to college, you didn't realize you had to make a deposit or you didn't realize there was some forms you needed to submit. Or you get your bill and it says $14,000 and you think that it's covered and it's not. So you have to figure out uh, how to manage that that particular debt uh, a year ahead of time so there's no surprises for you uh, at the end. Right? So we do all of that stuff throughout the year. We work with parents, with students. Once our kids graduate and go off to college, we continue to advise them uh, at the institution where, where they've arrived. So it's a six-year commitment that we have. So it usually takes our kids about six years to, uh, to graduate from college. Uh, for us, our graduation rate is 66% over that six-year period. The national cohort average is about 21% for first-gen low-income students as well. So what works? What works is that we can provide one-on-one -on -one -on -one advising to students, right? Guidance counselors usually carry a load of 250 students, if they're lucky, per guidance counselor. That's a lot of people that go in and out of those doors. And perhaps, maybe, that contributed to the response that I got while I was in high school, right? My guidance counselor didn't necessarily know me and was like, well, you know, I don't really have time for you, so look, look this other way in terms of uh, career educational uh, path. So um, we have this unique program with uh, one of the institutions in Rhode Island, Rhode Island College, where uh, we have 100 students. So 100 of our uh, high school graduates have gone to this place and uh, they're currently, currently studying there. So the, uh, they have what's called the Learning for Life Center. It's an advising center. And we partner with them. We actually have staff that sit at that center and advise our College Vision students that are currently there. And so the idea is to co-advise and to be liaisons for them on campus so whenever challenges come up, uh, if they don't self-advocate and come to us, we can kind of reach out to, uh, to those departments on their behalf. So we find that that's a very successful model, and maybe this is part of answering one of the, the questions that we have for later on. But we find that that's a successful model that's actually uh, graduating students at a higher rate than those students that graduate from uh, that particular school, Rhode Island College, or the state average uh, as a whole. 
So I'll stop there, but just wanted to give you a little bit of my background and some of the work that we do at CV. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for bearing with me as I stand behind this podium. I think I'm too awkward to manage doing this and sitting in that chair, so <laughs> I appreciate your patience and apologies to anyone who's behind this pillar over here. So again, my name is Nadia Williams. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the director of the Parsons Scholars Program, which is our access program here at Parsons. We are a free three-year program where students from New York City public high schools explore art and design here on campus in a curriculum that centers people of color, and specifically people of color from low-income backgrounds. It's important to note the context through which we build the work of the Parsons Scholars Program. As mentioned by some of our panelists, we are starting from the point of recognizing that the system of higher ed, and specifically the new school in Parsons, were not built with people of color in mind intentionally, right? So that's something that is important to acknowledge and to actively resist and reimagine what this system can look like, because we're here now, right? Another important piece of context is that we recognize that what's lacking within, so for us the context is art and design. What's lacking is access to positions of power, what's lacking is compensation, what's lacking is access to institutions, so we recognize that people of color have a long and rich legacy of being artists and designers, right? That's not what's lacking. It's not that we are not intrinsically creative or we're not artists and designers already, but we need our access to institutions and systems, right, of, that include a lot of historical privilege and power. Uh, I'm gonna go back. My mind is also, <laughs> similar to Suhaini, I also have a sick four-year-old at home and my mind is all over the place, so I'm also relying heavily on my notes, so thanks again for your patience. Um, one, one more thing I just wanna add in for context for us is that it's necessary for us as a program to resist notions of charity. In other words, it's important to recognize that the work of the Parsons Scholars Program is not charity work, it's access work, right? So we're thinking about how can we hold ourselves accountable to systems, when we, when we recognize that the systems that we have access to haven't already intentionally considered people of color in the creation of those systems, right? So how can we be conscious of that? And it's not, it's not that we're doing anyone a favor, it's that we're acting actively on, on a history within our, our systems. So the work that we do is a balance between pragmatic and radical work. So we consider it to be a radical act to create a space for young people of color to thrive, right? To explore art and design. That is simply a radical act. Also, we recognize that artists are at the center of social movements, right? At all, at the center of all social movements, and not in the not in the margins. Those are radical actions for us. On the pragmatic end, we understand that it's important to support our students in making well-informed decisions about their potential college paths, their career paths, and thinking about how those things are connected to financial decisions, right? So our students, again, are all students of color, they're all from low-income backgrounds, and they're daring to pursue art and design. So it's important to be pragmatic in that exploration as well as it is to be radical. Part of that being pragmatic is that all of the costs are covered in the program. Students graduate from our program with as having taken seven pre-college courses, they receive six college credits that they can transfer anywhere, they receive art supplies for any of the studio classes they're taking, all of the meals are covered, all of the metro cards to get to and from class, to and from field trips, uh, and uh, SAT prep. So all of those things are covered as part of the, the cost of the program, it's free to students. And in thinking about who we're recruiting for the program, we're really intentional about who will benefit most from this opportunity, right? So we think about how can we reach students? So we reach out to all public schools here in New York City, and we think about how can we reach specifically students from low-income backgrounds, attending any public school, from all immigration statuses, including undocumented students, and students who are specifically in need of art and design opportunities and guidance through the college application process. 
It's important to note that talent is not an eligibility criteria for us, so we're not looking for the student with the most polished portfolio, although some people do come in with really incredible portfolios. We're looking to work with students who are really demonstrating an ability to commit in their development to art and design and explore, like, what are the possibilities? Um, and we believe, and we've seen through time, that that talent can be cultivated over time. And also we're committed to the success of all of our eligible applicants. And this is important to us in realizing that we're asking students from low-income backgrounds to come to Parsons to apply to this program in a really rigorous application process. Part of that process is going to be rejection or denial. And that's really important to us to be sensitive to that and thinking of how we're, uh, how we're communicating the process to our students and also in how we're thinking through what the process is. So what does it mean for a student from a low-income background to come to a college campus for the first time and potentially be rejected because we only can accept 24 students in a year, right? And so we engage with students in that dialogue about what it means to face rejection and to not let that stop you from pursuing other opportunities. We do our best to share other opportunities with students as well. And lastly, we approach our access with a multi-directional lens, meaning that part of the work is all of the things I'm talking about up until now, which is working with young people and making sure that they are super prepared to access an education in art and design on a college campus. They're able to access art and design fields. The other really important part of that work is also to make sure that we're working with institutions, and Suhini talked about this a little bit as well, so that they're prepared, so that institutions and art and design fields are able to receive our students, right? So it's a two-way process, and either one of those, working on either end of that spectrum, I would say is useless without working on the other end, right? So it's really important to do both of those things at the same time. We have a really wonderful opportunity to do this work here at Parsons because we're within one of those institutions that has a lot of power within the art and design world and as an institution of higher education, so we really, as a program, hold ourselves accountable to advocate for our students of color, students from low-income backgrounds, first-generation students, students from different immigration statuses, to think about how those students are served here on campus and also out in the art and design world. And so this is what success has looked like, um, I would say, in like a pretty, kind of like looking at the flat level of success. So we have about 400 alumni at this point. Uh, the program has been in place for 20 years. More, more recently, I would say the past 10 years has been in the, when the program has been really more centering people of color specifically. All of our students are graduating from high school, the majority are enrolling in college, and the majority are pursuing art and design. And on a more personal level, our alumni are really incredible. They stay engaged in really meaningful ways. Our alumni also are demonst our, our students and our alumni are demonstrating a really meaningful commitment to social justice in the work that they pursue creatively and professionally and also just how they navigate the world. And our community is really a lifelong network. So our students, our staff who are really incredible, our alumni are really, we really have noticed that this community extends well beyond the three years of the program. So I'm excited to talk more about the program and just our work within College Access with uh, the rest of the pe panelists and all of you. And this is how you can learn more information about the program for those of you that are interested. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It's so such an interesting um, and array of um, access points um, and, and I think that one of the key things that's emerging for us as an institution of higher education is to think about the, the handoff from the, the transition from high school to college and that that, um, that level of preparedness needs to be there. Um, I've asked the panelists in advance to consider two questions and, and what we'll turn to now is their thoughts on these two questions. Um, and then following that, um, I hope we'll have a uh, robust time for, for Q&A from the audience and, and your thoughts on these questions as well. So the first question was a question that asks, aside from cost, although I want to pause and say, as has been clear in the comments thus far, it's very, it's very hard to consider these issues aside from cost. We know that cost is really at the root of much. Um, but um, I, the question I asked is, aside from cost, what are the main barriers that are standing in the way of access to education? And so 
I, I like to just make the, the caveat that I know that cost intersects with a lot of those barriers, but um, you know, we, we could maybe begin by saying um, in, in a very utopian way, if, if college was free, um, you know, there, that'd be, that would be one approach, but I've asked them to, um, the panelists today to, to consider what else, what other barriers intersect with cost, I guess is the way I might say it. And the second question I asked is, what promising approaches have you seen that will help move the needle on access to higher education and equity in higher education? And, and some of those answers have been embedded in the remarks, but um, I've asked them to, to consider that question both within their own work and organizations, but even um, elsewhere. And we don't need to go in any particular order. Nick, did okay you want to start? It? Yeah, sure. <coughs> So uh, just touching upon the, the free college idea, right? Um, in Rhode Island, we have, we have a uh, scholarship that allows uh, students to attend the Community College of Rhode Island for free, right? And uh, this scholarship kicks in if the student uh, doesn't qualify for Pell, right? So it helps a certain economic segment uh, of our students in the state. And so the other students, our students, for example, uh, would have to go through Pell in order to, uh, to pay for the entire year. So there's been discussion about uh, going to a four-year state school and actually the legislation that was introduced last year to try to make the last two years of that particular college free as well, but the students who would who would attend the community college wouldn't be able to transfer to that institution and just have a free, you know, uh, four-year uh, four experience. So, you know, a few years back, I took some students to Montreal, and we uh, visited the University of Montreal, and we asked uh, the students there, how much do you pay to come here? And they were like, well, if, you, if we live in the province, we don't pay anything. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's great. Why don't we do that back in the States? And so I'm a big fan of free college. I think we should do that because it ultimately uh, strengthens our democracy, at least I like to think that. Um, but here's the downside of free college, right, and, and a barrier to uh, post-secondary education. When you have free college, it means that, uh, you know, now you have more students, in, particularly if it's an in-state institution, you have more applicants to those institutions. Now, the issue lies inherently with K through 12 districts. Sorry about that, my phone, is it my phone? Yes it is, hold on. I'm busy. <laughs> uh, K through 12 districts who are underperforming. And those districts tend to be heavy with students of color, right? For example, in Providence, uh, Providence School District is 90% students of color. Yet for our, for our kids, uh, we have about, and these are estimates because I don't remember the exact numbers, but 12% are proficient in English and less than that percentage are proficient in math, okay? So if you do have a free college system, right, these kids are not gonna be able to compete with those other students who may come from different districts they have um, uh, tests higher and have, you know, uh, AP courses, et cetera, uh, introduced in their schools. So K through 12 to me is a barrier in terms of the access to uh, post-secondary education. And, you know, my, I, I shared my story, uh, but certainly there are other kids who, uh, if we compared at the same age, would run academic circles around me that still couldn't have access to some of these uh, institutions as well. So in order to create better access to the next level, we have to make sure that we look at our K through 12 and figure out how we can strengthen the K through 12 system so that our students have a fighting chance by the time it comes for them to uh, apply to these institutions. Now we have to, the other side is the institution that we also have to, uh, to talk to and figure out how to create equitable uh, access for our students. But I, just thought I would mention it. So I, I agree with a lot of points that Nick made around the, the cost of the college and the free college. So 
I think the issue is that we, when we talk about free college, we're only thinking tuition, and we need to think about total cost of attendance. The fact remains that because so many of our students are low income, they've had free college for a really long time, right? They are eligible for Pell, they're eligible for TAP, these are state and federal funding that allows them to go to community college completely for free. So the, in terms of tuition. So the issue hasn't been the tuition alone, it's the fact that when we think cost, we don't think books, we don't think transportation, we don't think meals. We don't think if the student goes to Buffalo, how does she come home during Christmas break, right? And so the issue continues to be cost because we're very narrow with our definition of what cost is. So if you think about your own child and if you're middle class and you think about your child going off to college and saying, mommy, I need this for books. Mommy, I need to go to a play. I would like to hang out with my friends. I need Uber money. Our kids, and I, and then I was just saying to Nadia, I have a really bad habit of calling our students kids. My grades are showing. I know a lot of our students have adult responsibilities. Some of them have children of their own, right? Um, especially in a system this large, we have about 70,000 students who graduate every year from New York City public schools. So we run the gamut, but um, I'll continue to say kids because they're part of my village. So our kids are dealing with, and, and Anthony Jack, which uh, you mentioned, um, if you haven't read his book, The Privileged Poor, or seen his TED talk, it is really amazing about all of these other barriers that really intersect with cost. So if I'm away at a college and my friends all wanna hang out, I don't have hangout money. <laughs> I'm not able to go to a restaurant. I'm not able to take the Uber to hang out with them. So that's why all the, the kids of a certain socioeconomic status hang out together because they only have money for free events on campus. And so you have to think about that when you're programming for your students. And so some of the, the barriers comes in that uh, we don't fully understand what it means to be poor in this country. And so we take things for granted. There's some colleges that are doing a better job. You have uh, deans of admissions that are for first generation college, for example, goers. And I think that these colleges have a much more deeper understanding and a deeper commitment to our students to say, oh, you don't have money to go for Christmas break. Uh, we can't close the dining hall because how are you going to eat? Right, so this is what I mean by student-ready colleges, right? So now you admit these students, you're so excited, you're saying that now your Pell-eligible students are the highest it's ever been. How are you changing the structures in your schools to support those students? And if you're not, if it looks the same as it did last year, then you don't have a college completion agenda, right? You don't. Because you need, to, you need to understand that these students are coming with a, a certain um, level of support that they need, and you knew that when you read their applications. You, re you knew that when you read their college essay. And so I think that there's this um, barrier around uh, understanding total cost, but also how welcoming are you of our students, right? That feeling of belonging. If I need to like ask for certain things and it's not given to me, privilege is not having to ask for things, it's just there, right? Our students have to constantly ask for things. And as a first generation student, I remember having to be like, oh wait, this is an unpaid internship? Is there a scholarship, right? Um, wait a minute, you're expecting my dad to pay this much for college, did you see how much he was working and how many hours he worked in a supermarket? Like, do you expect for him to work more hours in order to pay this? So we're constantly having to ask. Other students, they don't have to ask. It, the need is just met or the need is just not there. And so in terms of barriers, um, besides uh, uh, attendance, I mean, a uh, cost, besides advising structures, right? Because some schools have it and some schools don't. Uh, besides thinking about um, whether the facilities are available or not. And then the third factor would be the, the parent and the family engagement, right? Some, some, stu some schools are really, really big about geographic diversity. 
We want to bring this student from this other place where they need to take a plane, but yet this, this student is now in this space where she may be the only one, and then she's not able to see her family who's back home. And so we need to make sure that we engage families because in, for first generation students, it's not the student that goes to college, it's the family that goes to college. And when I was doing college advising, if mom said no, then that's no. Because if I'm not gonna be there when the child is crying, you know, because she's having a hard time, mom has to be there. And if mom said, well, I told you, you shouldn't have gone there in the first place, then that's what, that's what, what um, that's going to lead to some attrition, right? Like, that's going to be a problem. So I always say for the K through 12 world, if we have the child for four years in high school, we have the mom for four years in high school. So the first time you tell, hey, student, go to Buffalo, I have to then say, hey, mom, we're thinking about Buffalo for your child, <laughs> right? What do you think about that? Uh, so family engagement is important, um, and it's, so it's, it's really a barrier because we don't engage. That's really why it's a barrier. We don't really, um, it's hard enough to engage our students given the ratios that Nick talk about, and they're there every day. Can you imagine having to engage the parents who have um, multiple jobs and other uh, responsibilities? So I'll, I'll end it there in terms of barriers. I would build off of that and say that I think Thinking about barriers within institutions, I think a big barrier is when we fail to recognize how our institutions have failed to support students from historically marginalized communities over time, right? So thinking about students from low-income backgrounds, first-generation college students, um, undocumented students, right? So if we aren't aware of the history that has prevented specific populations from accessing the, the education of our institutions, then we're not going to be able to shift the system so that they actually work for those students to support them, right? So I think that there's a lot of energy often spent, and it's not, this is not to downplay the importance of it, but there's a lot of emphasis on anti-bias training, for example, and while that's hugely important for the people who are already here, I think that we, it, the work requires a much deeper level of, um, of attention, right, and, and specifically expertise, I would say, and leadership, where it's not just working with folks who are already here who already have their focus or their attention on many other things, but it requires an attention and, and leadership of, of deep leadership that understands the historical implications and also the innovation to be able to imagine our ways out of, out of these systems. Uh, right, I, I agree with pretty much everything that's been said here so far. And on the flip side of what you say, there's also something to be really worried about, which, uh, which is a non, and it's hard for me to think past the money, because I mean, it's just, it encompasses everything, but there is a certain elitism in this country, and I have to tell you, I pay, I pay close attention to the zeitgeist, what the media says, I mean, just excruciatingly uh, thorough, detail attention do I pay to the zeitgeist on this issue. And over the past 10 years, we have seen a rise in little seeds being planted in the media like, oh, you don't need college, you don't need college. I mean, come on, you can get, you know, people like Peter Thiel, the founder of PayPal, he's a billionaire. He went on this big uh, thing um, telling people, oh no, forget about college, you don't need it, do it yourself. Um, go out and start a business. Well, if Peter Thiel hadn't gone to Stanford, number one, he would have never been able to found PayPal. And if you look at Peter Thiel's website on the day that he made that big, you don't need college speech, Every single job posting for his investment firm demanded a master's degree or more from a top 20 university. So, to Peter Thiel. Um, uh, so the most confidence I have looking out in the world is, number one, young people are just naturally creative. It's a survival instinct. So thankfully, uh, we're covered there. I mean, the natural talent is out there. Um, but beyond that, I think it's very important, and thanks to the New School for even having this conversation, uh, for colleges, particularly the elite colleges, you know, the really good schools like where we are here today, 
uh, have to take it very seriously. You know, passion comes from the administration, from the faculty, uh, and I would say also from the alumni and donors and former students and, um, and, and so forth. Um, and I have kind of so-so confidence on that. I mean, looking out in the schools that I see, some people say, yeah, we want more diversity. But they don't really mean it, frankly. Um, and I won't mention any names, like the University of Southern California, but um, <laughs> where I went. Um, where I have the least confidence, and again, it comes down to the money, is the government and the lending system that is standing over this thing like the sword of Damocles. I don't think college should be such a fearful, such a daunting, a, th a threat to people, but you know, that's what I'm seeing in the zeitgeist. Oh, you know, don't go to college, you don't need it, you can figure it out yourself. And everybody's saying that, look and see where their kids are going to college. I guarantee you their kids are going to Princeton, Yale, Harvard, etc. cetera. Uh, um, and, and so that's, I guess, my, my, my three comments. Um, pay attention to the zeitgeist, because there are some very wealthy people that really don't like disadvantaged communities to be educated. They just, they don't like it for a number of reasons, so be uh, careful what you read. Thanks for those comments. I, I have a, just a couple of things to add. I mean, one, one to add to what Alan is saying, um, what I really appreciate about your perspective and I think is so needed is that I also think that the institutions of higher education are the ones that are blamed in the media. That's what I take from the zeitgeist. We are, to we are told that we are too expensive. And my personal answer is I know, I know we are very expensive, but I think that it, it, if we look at, we have to look at our entire society and ask the question of what's the government's role in that, what has changed around lent granting money to students versus borrowing. That's something, the history of which I learned from Alan's book. Um, versus a country, versus other countries that manage to offer very high quality education, not at this cost. So I think we need to we need to take our stand and take our voice in showing that it's not it's not our fault solely solely. Um, and the other thing I wanted to add to what Suheni said and some of the other comments that were made that is so important is to think about not only what you're saying about, I, I, I really appreciate that formulation that, that privilege means not having to ask, but I want us to really all think too about what kind of um, emotional toll it takes and what kind of psychological toll it takes to constantly have to ask. All that time spent um, finding you know, the extra dollars, going back to, your, to the family or the financial aid office, that is all time that isn't being spent on, on schoolwork, on being part of the community, on, um, and so forth. Um, we, Tim keeps quoting this interesting um, research finding that the students who succeed most in college are the ones who get integrated into the academic community. And so it's very hard to do that when these other stressors are constantly, are constantly at play. So I think that um, beginning, as Nadia is saying, by, by recognizing that and trying to figure out how we can um, support the needs of students and, and correct for that to some extent um, will be part of the answer. Um, but if I may turn you now to the second question, and, and I, it is, it, it, people in this, a few people in this room know that I am accused of being a Pollyanna. So I'm, I'm trying to search for the optimistic moment here and ask, um, what's working? Um, what will work? What's working? What have you seen? I know many of you, um, Nick, what you're doing with College Visions, what Parsons Scholars Program is doing, those are some of the things that's working. But I, I wanted to hear the four of you elaborate on that, on that question. Sure, I can start. I have a, a short list. Um, I think that a promising approach would be to deconstruct what we're talking about when we're talking about merit. So again, like I'm always approaching this work from the lens of someone who works at Parsons, right, as a program director and as faculty. So I think that it's worth thinking about what we're talking about, meaning like in admissions at Parsons or other art schools, we're thinking of things like, um, or not, maybe not what we're thinking about, but the things, factors that are that come into play are who has access to test prep, for example, right? Who has access to a personal tutor? Who has access to a personal photographer to document my artwork? Who has access to a, a personal tutor who can curate my my portfolio, right? All of these things, um, those have play a large role in 
how that student's merit is determined, right? And at, at different institutions, students receive scholarships for merit, right? So I, I would advocate for reconsidering how we, how we even frame what merit is, and also I, I would advocate for prioritizing need-based aid over merit-based aid, um, meaning like I personally don't see this may be controversial at the Parsons, but I personally don't see the, the value for students receiving a scholarship for merit if there's no financial need, right? That seems like pretty basic, but. <laughs> and I also really find it hopeful to follow the lead of local community organizers. So we think about in this moment where the New York State Dream Act recently passed, that is the direct result, yes. That is the direct result of community organizing, so specifically or, uh, groups like the New York State Leadership Council, which is a group of undocumented and immigrant youth who have been organizing for years, who are barely mentioned in the press when, when the announcements are made. Um, groups like that following their lead and understanding, following the lead of communities who are directly impacted by long histories of, of oppression, right? Um, and I think also, I find a lot of hope in the folks already working in institutions. There are so many people that I meet through the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in Higher Ed, people here at the New School at Parsons who are doing amazing work around racial equity, around access, um, supporting students from low-income backgrounds, the sanctuary working group. There are endless, there are endless um, amounts of people who are really committed to making this institution, and I would say all higher education institutions more accessible, which is why I think that it's really important to really institutionalize that leadership because it's not that there aren't people here who are motivated and, and, and I'm talking about students and staff and faculty and leadership, but it really needs to be embedded into the structure of the university so that there are resources and expertise and, and leadership that can, can follow the lead of people who are already here doing amazing things. So I think uh, what I'd like to do is just touch upon uh, the model again that we, the partnership that we have with one of the state colleges. Uh, I think what, what works there, and, and maybe in many ways this is a pilot for other institutions, uh, is that you know, not only are we, are we uh, there on campus co-advising students, being liaisons for them, but we also ha have access to the president's office. And so we do quite a bit of advocating uh, through that avenue as well. And so this particular institution, Rhode Island College, uh, what they've done is they've, uh, based on feedback, they've created food pantry uh, for students. Uh, they also provide housing now during the summer and during winter breaks, uh, Thanksgiving breaks, for those students who don't have a home to go to. Uh, and so I think, you know, as we, as we look at how uh, how we reshape um, education in this country and, and know what the uh, economic divide is now, um, you know, universities, colleges have to meet students where they're at. And it can be no longer be the relationship of just having you sitting in the classroom and, and providing the instruction, but you have to look at the whole person and figuring out what support services does that student need. Do they need uh, <laughs> mental health service support? Do they need um, transportation support, uh, et cetera? And I think uh, once you get to that place, then we start to change the paradigm uh, for students who are uh, accessing higher education. So I am encouraged by a lot of different things happening, uh, not just at the state level, like the DREAM Act, which provides um, state funding to undocumented students. Uh, but in New York City, we have a lot of youth organizers, and they are so invigorating. Uh, my first job was at a CBO where I was doing some community organizing work, and so there's a lot of things that happen top from the top down, right? The institution, and you have those um, those folks that are really committed to disrupting uh, those inequities. But you also have a lot of our history has been bottom up, 
right? And so in New York, we have uh, great institutions like Teens Take Charge, and they've actually said the fact that New York City is the most segregated school district in the country is not okay, right? And they've been marching and standing in front of where I work. My office is by City Hall. I work for Central. And I love seeing them there. I love the fact that they are taking charge of their own education and saying there is value in having um, books that reflect our ethnicity. And so now there's been a push for um, culturally responsive education. They, because of all the organizing and Teens Take Charge is not the only organization, it's just the only one that comes to my fuzzy brain right now. Um, but they've done culturally responsive education. Because of them, we, know, we now have a charge to make sure that every single person who works for the Department of Education, which is about 130,000 of us, are trained on implicit bias and understand what are the racial and economic um, injustices that have been, you know, that are part of just the historical context of this country. And so the question that keeps coming to us is, are our schools, not just K through 12, but K through 16, are we just perpetuating inequities? Are we disrupting the status quo and really increasing educational access? Or are we having the opposite effect of just entrenching the, the, diff like the, the economic stratification of this country? And so what's encouraging to me is that you have the largest school district in the country having that conversation for the first time. And that as a, as a nation, Varsity Blues really shook us to our core, right? We have Felicity Huffman, we have Lori, right? We have all these people, and we're like, oh my god, what? This is happening, and it made it to the People magazine, it made it to Newsweek, but what I take away the sensationalism, it's really about a conversation about privilege, and how do people hold on to their privilege and even go on to having to do criminal activity to privilege their already privileged child. And so if you've ever thought that college is not important, think about Varsity Blue and the extent that these people are going through to, uh, to make sure that they hold on to that access. Because it's not just go to college, but it has to be the right college that gives you access to the right people so that we can reproduce this power that we currently have and are trying to hold on to, right? Like, that's how I interpret it, interpret Varsity Blue. And it's, listen, there's a lot of more conversation I can have from my admissions days. Um, and because it's, it's really been, and then there's uh, also the, the other encouraging news was that Harvard was being sued, right? And they're saying that you can't use race. Um, but now the, the judge said, yes, you can. You can use race, right? Race is protected by our Constitution. Uh, so I think the conversations around affirmative action are really, really important to me because from the beginning, I would say, there's a whole lot of different kinds of affirmative action. There's a whole bunch of people that get a whole lot of affirmations, and they don't look like me. Um, you know, legacy is a form of affirmative action. Athletics are a form of affirmative action. And again, Varsity Blues kind of elevated that conversation so that when people would say, what do you believe in, race, in, in, in affirmative action? And I'm like, the race-based affirmative action that only touches but this percent of your very elite institution? Like, what? why are we talking about such few students, right? And so the conversation, the activism, and the commitment to stay in this conversation is what's really encouraging to me. Well, in my view, I can certainly tell you what's not working. Um, I spend most of my time there. Um, I will say just generally, scholarships, not loans, works, for sure. If we're gonna have high prices for college, uh, then certainly scholarships rather than loans work. My hope is that in the next two to three years, the loans themselves, when we get our constitutional bankruptcy rights back, cannot reemphasize how important that is, um, I think that we will probably come to a place where will um, hearken the words of Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1965, who promised that the loans would be interest-free. We've got to take the, the, 
the terrible capitalist vulture motive out of these loans. And I think that will really free up everything. And so here's to hoping. Wow, thank you everyone. That's so, such, such great. And I'm, we, we, we did it. We managed to leave time for questions. So um, I, this is the point where we'll turn to questions from the audience. And I, Anthony will, um, will bring a mic to you. So I ask, I know there's a tendency to not like to use the mic, but um, we're recording this. And so if you don't ask your question into a microphone, it won't make it onto the video. Should I stand up? Uh, okay. Oh, hi. Hi, um, my name is Hian. I'm a student here at Parsons, and I come from a low-income family. I experienced firsthand the, dis the, the discrimination I've had at the new school. So I'm here because I wanted, I wanted to be part of this conversation. But I guess I'm just a little bit mad because you have this panel. You have this facade, but you don't do anything to really help lower income students. The amount of obstacles I had to go through just to get a basic education was a, a lot. It was a lot emotional toll for me. And I've gone to your office, I've said my stuff, and nothing has changed. So my question is, would you be willing to meet with students that come from low-income families for us to have this conversation? I'm really glad that we're having a panel to do this and stuff, but you're not really asking the students like what we really need. So I really would want to have a conversation with everyone, the board president, I don't care, but I just really want to have a discussion, but not only have a discussion, but have concrete steps that comes after it. So students like me in the future, they don't have to come and feel alienated, feel stuck, feel that they don't belong, and feel that we question our motives every day if we're willing to be in this space. Because we come up in this space and we don't feel comfortable. So yeah, that's my question. so much for your comments and, and um, your heartfelt sharing your feelings here, which I know, I know is hard too. And um, the answer is yes. Yes. Let's organize those meetings. Let's continue this conversation. Um, somebody said yesterday, as I was talking about this panel, um, that we need to make it a whole series and we need to think of this as only the start to what has to be a much longer and deeper conversations where we are self-reflective and, and look at how to support our own students um, better and support the success of every single student. So yes, I'd love to follow up with you and I welcome that. And by the way, you hit on like every single point, like the whole point, so I just wanted to let you know that like you hit at every mark, so thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your bravery. This is what I mean by having to ask. We become really good self-advocates and really great leaders, so I can't wait to see what else you have in store for this school. This school will be different because of you. Hi, my name is Sophia. I graduated from the BOF program in 2016. Um, and I guess in response to that, I was an RA here. I was a resident advisor in the housing program or housing department, and I found it really empowering to be able, one, don't have to pay for uh, dorm expenses, um, but two, we were able to make a difference even as a little bit, um, and I would highly recommend trying to get into the housing department in any way possible because that was a way for all of us to kind of gather as students, as a community, and work with the administration and the higher leadership to be able to try and change you, your disparities, your struggles, your challenges, and uh, make a difference. So that's my response to that. Um, question. Uh, I, I mean, I come from a um, first generation. I'm not a first generation. My grandparents, I'm third generation. Um, but I guess I'm curious, 
about your opinions on trade school because although I believe in education and it's very important, uh, my mom went to trade school and my grandparents didn't go to college at all and they didn't really graduate high school either. Um, they immigrated from Mexico and Nicaragua. So I'm curious your if trade school is becoming more of a thing and a lot of students I met as an RA here, I saw that they were not actually taking advantage of the privilege of being able to be here, regardless of money or where, whatever their background is. Um, and they were essentially just wasting an opportunity for another student to be here, wasting money, just wasting people's time. Um, and I'm curious your thoughts on kind of providing resources for people who maybe aren't interested in higher education or want to just work, pursue a career that essentially is just not dying, like we're always gonna need plumbing, electricians, mm -hmm. dentists, di not, I'm not gonna say doctors. <laughs> well, we always need doctors, um, but just your yeah. thoughts on that. So we, we think a about this a lot for the College Access for All High School, and we define college as any cert certification or education after high school, right? So um, we have about 500 high schools in New York City, 100 of which are career and technical education schools, the Back in the day, they used to call those vocational schools, voc ed. And so the answer is yes, we do believe in that. But the, the thing that makes it trickier for these um, certifications is that the quality of some of them are not the strongest. And so getting a sense of um, strong post-secondary credentials, high quality, that will lead to a real, like, um, we don't want it to be that you do these 10 month kind of certificates, and then it could, a lot of them are um, through a for profit, which Ellen already talked about, right? They have high default loan. They're actually worse off than if you would have never gone because now you have these loans and no credentials. So if they come from one of our CTE schools, they are already designed with a college in mind. They already have a union, right? They already have some kind of um, employer waiting to receive our students. Past that, vetting these colleges or, or programs, it becomes like a full-time job. And it, it changes so much, right, around um, the credentials. And some of these schools, they're just so questionable. So the answer is yes, if we can vet that is a high quality post-secondary credential that will guarantee to an employment opportunity. And those are far and few in between outside of our CTE schools. May I also add to, to that? Can I answer some of that as well? So, um, you know, for us, we're driven by our mission to uh, create a pathway to uh, post-secondary education. However, uh, we recently had a discussion about uh, trade schools. And so, you know, that's, that's a larger discussion that we'll need to have as an organization and figure out if we want to move in a direction where we are pointing some students uh, towards trade schools. Now, we'll say that um, personally, I'm, I'm not opposed to, to doing that. Um, but I think that uh, trade schools shouldn't be the option if you're denied access to a post-secondary uh, education, right? So uh, if, if that's the situation, then, you know, uh, and, and only reason you're considering trade school is because you can't go to, uh, you know, you've had some issues in, in your application or, or what have you, then that's a different story. It's a different conversation that needs to be had. But if a student says, hey, you know, I want to be an electrician and I don't want to go to college, obviously that's their, their choice to make, then at that point, you know, I think it's, it's okay for a student to uh, look in that direction. The last thing I want to add is that, um, just came, I told you my brain is fuzzy, so it's like working slow. Um, <laughs> we try to uh, then connect our students to CUNY, the City University of New York, or SUNY, for example, CUNY, um, BCC, Bronx Community College, has an amazing auto mechanic program. And so that way it is a reputable institution where you do have the possibility of possibly 
transferring credits if later on you say, you know what, I want to continue in my education, you already have a CUNY transcript. And then SUNY, the State University of New York, has their EOC Employment Opportunity Centers in each borough, where if you want to be a security guard or other things like that, you go there and again, you start off with a SUNY transcript. So for us, it's about saying, let's make sure that then we um, send you to reputable um, you know, organi uh, institutions of higher education, which again, even if you're getting a certificate, it's still in a college. <laughs> so that's why we continue to say, you're gonna need some form of education after high school, and it will probably take place at a college, even if it's not the more traditional two-year associate's degree or four-year um, bachelor's degree. Hello, my name is Kelsey Wilkins, and I'm a master's student in the Milano School. Uh, wait, this is on, right? Okay. Um, oh, okay. Um, so I haven't, this is my first semester, so I haven't had the opportunity to really gauge camp, cl campus climate yet, but I did spend four years at the University of Missouri, and for a student of color, that was not only like an incredibly difficult experience, but it was also rewarding. Um, but one thing that I learned was the value of representation, and how important it is to have faculty and staff of color on campus. So I just kind of wanted to um, get you all's kind of opinion on that and just kind of touch a little bit on how important that is, but then also kind of intertwine that with, I guess, equity and how, uh, how institutions should be making sure that faculty and staff are being treated in a way that they want to stay like their white counterparts and being treated in a way like pay and things of that nature. I feel like it wouldn't make sense for me to answer it. Yeah. <laughs> Get up here, Tim. <laughs> Just kidding. Where's Deborah? Oh, Belial. Oh, Deborah. Um, we. Um, I'm asking uh, for was for Deborah to identify herself because um, Deborah is president of the um, Association of Independent Colleges of Art and Design that Parsons is part of, and Deborah and I, along with a couple of other folks. Um, from ACAD around the country founded a teaching fellowship program that aims to do exactly that. Um, I'm very happy to say we have two fellows on campus, Mevluna and Matthew Villarreal. They may, I don't think they're in the room or they would have um, waved their hand. Um, so yes, I totally, totally agree with you. Um, we, we have, there is research that shows that students of color learn better from faculty of color. It's important that people see themselves reflected in the power structures that surround them, in their leadership, in their mentors, in their teachers. This is what um, s provides them role models for aspirations, um, provides the, some relief from the stressors that we've been talking about to be able to have um, faculty and staff um, who really understand um, where you're coming from. So it's really critically important that we are always working to ensure that we have the representation that we seek in our student bodies reflected in all levels internally up through um, senior leadership, through our board, and so forth. And, and we, have a, we have a long way to go there. Um, and it, as you can imagine, as you, as you might imagine when you think about it, when we think about history, as Nadia has pointed out, um, the access um, to those kinds of positions like senior leadership, which is a longer career path, um, means that we haven't yet made the inroads at those levels that we hope to in the next coming years. As we've had, I guess what I'm trying to say is, as we have, say, more faculty of color, we'll see more deans of color, we'll see more provosts of color and presidents. Um, but we certainly, we certainly have a long way to go in that regard. And, and we also know here at um, the New School that we have a lot of work to do in terms of ensuring cultures of respect that allow us to then um, not only hire that um, hire people into positions but retain them in those ways and that's going to be very big um, on our agenda this year and going forward. There's a question here and then Kate. 
Hi, uh, my name is Jessie Schleba, and I work here at Parsons in graduate admissions. Thank you so much uh, for all of your time and for guiding us in this very important conversation. My question is is riffing off what what was said about re reimagining and kind of redefining me what merit might mean, and I think that that is so interesting. And I want you to know that there are a lot of allies in admissions office that completely agree that we need to be shifting more towards financial aid based and need based scholarships and away from merit. But my question is, how, how has it been that in the past 50 or 60 years, we have seen a little bit of change in like the story that was told about registering for courses, right, with the old bulletin board. We've seen some encouraging changes recently where we're, we're seeing a movement away from standardized testing or making that optional. But the application process itself, itself has really very much stayed the same. There's an application, there's letters of reference or a resume, potentially a portfolio. So I would love any, I know we're putting you on the spot, but any ideas for how to reimagine an application process, right? How do applicants package themselves to how do they express themselves in a way that taps a little bit more into their potential and less about what sort of access or money that they've that they've had so far well, I, I can say that I I left the admissions world nine years ago and uh, during that time there was a shift to uh, look at students in a more holistic way um, and so you have your, you know, higher ed doesn't change very much, right? The, the new school is what, 100 years old? And, and I'm sure some of the principles uh, haven't changed much in, in that time frame. So moving away from a standard application, letters of reference, essay, you know, you really have to move mountains to, to be able to do that. Uh, but I think one of the ways that you begin to shift things is to have, uh, to, to take that holistic approach and look at everything that the student is involved in. Uh, whether it's after school activities, whether they have siblings that they babysit, you know, taking into account the, the entire picture of the human being of that individual, and then trying to assess the best way to uh, uh, either admit the student or to provide financial assistance to, uh, to that student as well. Um, in an admissions office that I worked in, we were sitting in a circle talking about uh, students who were applying to this particular institution. And uh, someone in that room said, oh, I have this student here. They have an A, but they go to this high school. And I was like, wait a minute, I went to that high school. What are you trying to say? <laughs> My A is not good enough you know, compared to that other uh, institution. And unfortunately, this is the way that admissions measures candidates currently. But I think looking beyond that and, and, and taking that holistic approach really will benefit the institutions, the student themselves, but the institutions in a way that they diversify their campuses. Uh, and it's also an opportunity to figure out how to best meet that student where they're at. So I'm also far removed from my admissions days, but I still do some um, student interviews for my alma mater. And the bigger conversation I would have, because I always think of what's in my locus of control, right? So there's a lot of changes, some that may take a year, some may take five years, and some that start with me that I can make immediate changes to. And so redefining merit is such an important conversation because for me, you know, so, so Nick would say, wait, that A is not the same as that other A, so questioning, right, is one of the most powerful tools we have. I would also redefine leadership. I found our, our, our um, you know, same thing committee, I would be head of committee and they would be like, oh, he's head of student government and that one you know, plays lacrosse. And I'm like, and this one has a full-time job, right? And so do you know how much leadership skills he has, right? So it's, if you cannot change the components of the, of the application, how you see, how you define, is there a common rubric that you can create that says, well, when this one reads um, this application, she defines uh, leadership this way, but when that one reads it, no, how do we define leadership? And what kind of leader are we looking for, right? Um, also risky, 
oh, I hated the academic risky thing. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. So this student has this AP, that, the other, but this SAT score is risky, right? And so bringing in um, all of this college board published information that says that the white student that's low income has a higher SAT score than the higher income African American student, right? Just to say, all right, how are we defining risk and why are we only looking at the, at the standardized test or the GRE or whatever kind of thing at the graduate level? So I think having those conversations and then the, the one thing that I, I would really look forward to every year, and I'm gonna tell you this, was when we would look at who we waitlisted and where they ended up, oh my God. Any time I would look at the, the, the student who got admitted and enrolling at a higher selective school than we, I'd be like, wait a minute, we thought she was risky, but Cornell didn't, right? <laughs> like, come on now. So it, it just, you know, it, it surfaces some of our implicit bias. It surfaces some of our own privilege and how we define um, leadership. I'm very, and I would always say, we all have biases, so put them on the table so we know what they are, right? Um, and having those really important conversations, if you haven't had those trainings, you need to start there, right? Just so that people know, like, yes, like, like I always say to people, I'm very biased for people with curly hair and glasses. Like, I just love them, right? Like, <laughs> and so like knowing and putting that out there, right? <laughs> um, I just do, and especially if they have like a, a strong Latina accent, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> right? Like, you remind me of my cousin. Uh, but we all have that, we all have, we all tend to go to what's familiar, that's what, that's what our implicit biases are. And so you're familiar with the girl who played lacrosse and whatever, because she reminds you of you or your child or your neighbor or whoever. Put those things on the table, redefine and reimagine what they are, and then norm around it and say, this is the value of our team. Are we comfortable with that? We're gonna take one more question, but just, and then wrap up, but just before we do, I wanna mention a panel on Thursday at five o'clock, Ashley, which is um, Ibram Kendi's panel, How to Be an Anti-Racist, at six o'clock, very related to the content and things that have come up here. So um, I'll be there, I'd love to see others there. And um, just one final question before we wrap up. Can, I, actually, can I ask one quick question? I'm sorry, Kay, just before you ask your question, just of the audience, I would love to talk about that more. And I was just wondering by a show of hands, how many people have an idea to that question of like imagining a new kind of way of reviewing merit? Just if anyone wants to s stick around and maybe share some ideas after I'm happy to huddle and have that conversation because it's worth all the conversation. Thank you. Okay, hi. I'm Kay Unger, I'm the chairman of the Board of Parsons, and I want to applaud you for your bravery and I'm happy to listen to you. But one of my questions is, um, one of the things about less privileged kids at school is one of the things you talked about, and that is books and supplies and most important, food. Have any of you had any experience in how to solve that, because you talked about how scholarship solves. Why don't we have scholarships for, f when, you, when you apply, you say many of the kids come for free, but where's the scholarship for food? Where's the adjunct scholarship that pays for you to live? Because without that, it separates you and it makes you feel horrible. being really smart about meal plans, right? They just give you a meal plan for four years. You just have, you know, you have your ID. There's some other colleges that are doing the pantry, but that's still you looking and, and being different, right? So a lot of colleges will do like that first year meal plan, and then that's it, you're on your own? Why? <laughs> like, why are you on your own? Um, what? What is it that we're thinking? We're thinking that the parents are gonna pay for it? or like So the, the colleges that do it right, take the total cost of attendance, give you a meal plan for four years that you don't have to ask for, and it's just on your ID and you go to the cafeteria, right? Like So there's a lot of different ways that we can do this that is just automatically packaged for the student, and so that the student doesn't have to ask. I think, um, does that answer your 
Okay. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to say was that uh, the conversation has been around student debt. The Department of Consumer Affairs here in New York City has financial empowerment centers and they have student debt clinics. You can go online if you know of anyone who is really going through like a difficult student debt situation. Um, and you can just uh, sign up for an appointment or call 311. So I just wanted to make sure that we have that as a resource, especially since we've been talking about student debt, uh, that there are um, some neighborhoods in New York City that are hit more than others. No surprise, the Bronx, right, our lowest um, income uh, neighborhood in New York City, or you know, they think you're from the Bronx, right? Uh, so if uh, any, any, anything around resources, think about the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Financial Empowerment Centers and how they have free resources to guide uh, folks to get out of debt. Oh, I, I just wanted to thank you for mentioning non-tuition related expenses because nationally it is such a game for like a lot of colleges, state colleges in particular, they'll have their <laughs> Uh, they'll have the state legislature say, no, you can't raise tuition uh, this year. And so what do they do? They, 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 they snowplow everything under other fees. And they can make up fees. Uh, I mean, it's, there's no limit to the fees that you can create out of thin air and funnel what would have been tuition increases into that. So uh, yeah, I, I think it's so important to talk about the, the total cost of college. Um, yeah. Thank you. Well, I we need to wrap up. Oh, one more? Nick? Yeah, no. just one more point. Uh, we have uh, College of Business, we created uh, an emergency fund to help students with books and other educational uh, related expenses. But we usually burn out through that rather quickly. But we, we do have uh, some assistance. So um, before we have a round of applause for our finalists, um, uh, for our panelists. <laughs> um, now, I'm on, now I'm like, you're, all of you, we want you all here all the time, so you're admitted or hired or whatever. <laughs> whatever it is, Nadia um, would like to huddle in the corner for a conversation. I, th I think that's okay, do we, is, no one needs the room right immediately after. Speaking of food, there is some food left over from breakfast over there, so I hope that you'll help yourselves. Um, and I look forward to continuing these conversations on campus. Um, and involving people from the community. Um, so let's, let's keep talking. But thank you, amazing panel.